what if the ant had laryngitis? It still wants to protect the butterfly. So in this case, it holds up a strobe lamp. And the strobe lamp sends light towards the butterfly. That way the butterfly will see the light fly away, won't get shot. So now we have to think about light. So light is also a wave of the EM field, the electromagnetic field. It moves very fast. Based on the properties of EM fields, we can calculate the speed of light, and it's 300 million meters per second. What we sometimes just call C in physics. It has its own symbol. Very fast, 300 million meters per second. But it's a little bit different because the EM field isn't really a physical material or object like air or like water, like waves in water. So it's really hard to define, um, think of it as being in a certain frame of reference. So in the late 19th century, people were really wondering, what is the material that light propagates through? And they thought, well, it must be sitting with rest with respect to something. So surely we can eventually detect this thing. So they called it the luminiferous ether, as it was called. So how can we detect this ether and figure out, is it stationary with the Earth, or is it moving with the sun, or is it stationary with a galaxy? What, how does it work? So to detect it, um, the most famous experiment was by Michelson and Morley. Or maybe it's Mickelson and Morley. I don't know. I call it the M&M experiment, because I don't want to say it wrong. And m and &M detected it by a method called interferometry. And here is just the absolute basics of interferometry. If I shine some light at a mirror, it'll reflect back. And when it reflects back and overlaps with itself, it might be in a condition where the waves add and you get positive interference, and you get twice as big of a wave, or it might be a condition where they cancel and you get zero. So by whether they're uh, adding or subtracting, you can detect very small changes. You can detect little changes in the spacing. You can detect little changes in the wave properties. It's an extremely sensitive technique. If you heard about the detection of gravitational waves in 2016, it was done by interferometry, extremely sensitive interferometry. So m and set up an interferometer. And the idea was that we know that the Earth is moving through space pretty fast. Right? So if this is the sun. The Earth is going at about 3 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. So if you imagine that the luminiferous ether is in space and it's at a constant uh, velocity in space, maybe stationary with respect to the sun, maybe flowing this way, it doesn't really matter. If I take my interferometer and hold it one direction relative to whichever way we're moving, I should see one set of conditions. And if I turn it 90 degrees, I should see a different set of conditions. Just by turning the interferometer, I can change how, or what direction these, this light is moving with respect to however the ether is moving. So you don't have to know the details of the ether, just you had to set that up and turn it 90 degrees. So m and did that, turned it 90 degrees, and saw absolutely nothing. They had a pretty good idea what they should see, because they know the speed of light, and they knew the speed of the Earth, presuming we're moving through an ether, but they got no results at all, which implies that there is no ether, which implies that there is no special frame through which light must travel 300 million meters per second. This really confused everyone, except Einstein. So Einstein had the insight to say, maybe Galilean transformations are wrong. Maybe it's actually the case that light goes this fast in any frame. So maybe it's the case that if we're standing here in the lab frame and we see the light come out of the strobe lamp, we say it went at 300 million meters per second. And if you're the ant on the bullet and he watches the light move forward. He also says it went 300 million meters per second. It sounds crazy to us because we grew up in a Galilean frame where this kind of effect isn't observed. But in reality, it's been tested to death, and this is really true. This is the basis of special relativity, the fact that light always travels at 300 million meters per second no matter what frame you're in. This leads to a lot of weird stuff, and we're just going to look at one aspect of what it leads to in the next video. We're going to look at time dilation. One more thing, though, I want to tell you about the m and experiment is that uh, if you go online, you can find lots of very fancy videos about it with beautiful graphics and 
lens flares and soaring music and very earnest uh, people talking about it and everything. Uh, but they really missed the most exciting part of this paper. What often helps is to really read the paper. And here's my favorite part. In the first experiment, one of the principal difficulties encountered was that of revolving the apparatus without producing distortion. Remember, they had to turn it 90 degrees. And another was the extreme sensitiveness to vibration. This was so great that it was impossible to see the interference fringes except at brief intervals when working in the city, even at 2 o'clock in the morning. Scientists love to brag about how late they work, and they actually put it in their paper. Finally, as before remarked, the quantity to be observed, namely a displacement of something less than a 20th of the distance between the interference fringes, may have been too small to be detected when masked by experimental errors. So they're basically saying, this is really hard. They like to point out how difficult this is. But this is the part I love. As an experimentalist, I love this part. The first name difficulties were entirely overcome by mounting the apparatus on a massive stone floating on mercury. So they didn't have air tables back then. They had this thing mounted on this massive, heavy stone table, and they said, we need it to be supported. They said, screw it. Let's just put it on mercury. Go buy 50 gallons of mercury and float it. This kind of experiment could only be done by two people. Because if I were in my lab and I thought, I could float this on a big vat of mercury, I'd then think, oh, no, that's a crazy idea. But if it's two people, one person says, we could float it on a big vat of mercury. And the other person says, yes, let's do that. Right? That's the reason only two people, or required two people to do this experiment. It's the greatest thing I ever heard. If I tried to order enough mercury to float a table today, the FBI would be showing up at my door pretty quickly. The other thing, if you read this uh, paper carefully, is something that often happens in science is we later sort of talk about how, oh, that paper made it clear at the time, and everybody understood as soon as that paper was published. That's kind of how we sort of remember things, often not how it is. So now we say, well, this was the paper that proved that there's no luminiferous ether. Well, that was not their conclusion, right? So at the time, they did not know they were proving there was no luminiferous ether. Their only conclusion, really, is that we are not moving with respect to a luminiferous ether. And if you read, they conclude that, and then they talk about how this impacts other people's work, and then they have a supplement where they say, here's some other experiments we could do to try to detect the luminiferous ether. So the conclusion is, one possibility is that it's more like a fluid, and as the Earth moves, it drags the ether with it. Right? So right at the surface of the Earth where we are, the ether isn't moving. But out in space, we're moving with respect to it. So they actually suggest what we got to do is get one of these tablets and go up on a mountain and do this on a mountain really high where maybe the ether is still moving past the Earth. And they also say, if we're doing this, we need to not have it inside a room because there were ideas that since light can't go through opaque objects like walls, maybe the ether can't go through an opaque object like a wall. So they say, what you got to do is get this on a mountain and have like a glass covering over it so that the ether could freely move through. So they clearly had not dropped the chalk and said there's no ether. They were clearly still thinking about ether. But when we look back now, and then later when we discover the electromagnetic field, then everything makes sense, except the reference frame part that required Einstein to figure out.